Good evening. Welcome to our celebration of Rossini's 220th birthday. <laughs> Rossini will turn 220 tomorrow on February 29th. And I'm glad that you're all here. So we are going to start at the beginning. Rossini was born in 1792 in Pesaro on the Adriatic coast of the east side of Italy. And he was a very bright young child. He had two parents who were somewhat musical, uh, particularly his mother was a terrific singer. Um, she, well, she was also a prostitute. Let's just get that. Uh, but, <laughs> so we don't really know if Rossini's father was Rossini's father, uh, but they were married sometime after Rossini was conceived in any case. And uh, Rossini's father was a slaughterhouse inspector and he was also a trumpeter. And so he played in some bands around Pesaro. Uh, unfortunately, he was not a very cautious man and he had a lot of political opinions and he spent much of Rossini's childhood in jail because of these <laughs> opinions. And then he would get out again and uh, hire Rossini to play triangle in his band when Rossini was six or something. And then he'd go back in jail. So uh, all of this was because Napoleon Bonaparte was moving through Italy uh, as well as other places and the French and the Austrians were sort of playing ping pong with the various uh, Italian provinces. So eventually um, the Rossinis moved back to where Rossini's father came from. They moved from Pesaro to Bologna and Bologna had much more of a musical life than uh, Pesaro. So uh, this was a great thing for little Rossini, who by this time was a pianist and a composer and a conductor and an arranger. And when he was 11 or 12, he would make money <laughs> at the opera house because sometimes there were numbers that weren't successful. And at that time, Italian opera was sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, you took one thing by the composer out and stuck another thing by a different composer in, and that made opera. So Rossini would do this even before he was a teenager. But it was irksome to him that he couldn't get into the Bologna Conservatory because his family was really poor, which, by the way, is why he was doing a lot of these things. And uh, because his family couldn't afford to be in any kind of society, Rossini had to sort of work his way in through the back door. So by the time he was 13, uh, he had this girlfriend who was older than he was. And, um, she wanted very badly to get the music to one of the pieces that they were doing at the Bologna Opera in an opera by Portogallo. But the Bologna Opera wouldn't release the music to this piece. So Rossini said, not a problem, and went to the opera, paid for his own ticket, and uh, wrote the whole thing out after hearing it <laughs> once. And um, you may know a story about Mozart that's very similar, that Mozart heard the Miserere by Allegri once, uh, and in the same town in Bologna and, and wrote it out because the church wouldn't let the music be released. So uh, Bologna inspired these young geniuses somehow and Rossini presented the music and somehow then gained entree into the Bologna Conservatory. Well, the professor, uh, Mattei, was a very highly thought of musicologist. He taught counterpoint and he taught all of the rules of harmony and Rossini must have been his worst student because Rossini really had very little interest in learning how to write three-part counterpoint. He wanted to write operas, which he did. So he started writing his operas when he was 14, and uh, they, they had some, some small success, but the break came when he was 18 years old and some friends of his parents passed through um, the, the name was um, Monardi, and uh, Signor Monardi was a, um, a conductor and a composer, and Signora Monardi was a singer, and um, they were on their way to Venice. And uh, he was 18, and Mattei had just proposed he do a two-year course in writing canons, and uh, this to Rossini said, get out of Bologna. So he went with the Monardis, and he wrote something in Venice that was a very popular form with the Venetians. They wrote one act farces, just the way uh, you know, the, the Germans had operettas and we have musicals, they loved these one act farces. And the tunes from these became so popular that the Venetians would sing them in the streets and uh, 
our dear friends, Chuck and Maura, introduced us to the two warring cafes on the Piazza San Marco, the Cafe Florian and the Cafe Quadri. Now, even then, in uh, 1812, the Quadri and the Florian would war with each other, and the tunes from one famous farce would be played in the Quadri, and then the Florian would strike up a more famous one louder across the piazza. <laughs> So uh, even then, the Italians were doing this, right? So the spirit of the time was that there were these great popular entertainments. And uh, Rossini, at age 18, contributed his Il, il uh, Cambiale di Matrimonio, the switched up marriage. And uh, it was a huge hit. So he went back to Bologna, and he thought he would write another one of these farcical, somewhat bawdy, one-act farces. Uh, and he wrote something called L'Equivico Stravagante, about two men fighting over a girl, and the younger one, of course, is supposed to win out, so he convinces the older one, who's a sort of commedia dell'arte character, that really the young girl is a castrato in disguise, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and what's more, has deserted from the military. This was censored immediately in Bologna. <laughs> Bologna was a papal state. You could not do what you could do in Venice. So Rossini went back to Venice, <laughs> and he was very um, intent on, on writing, writing um, more farces, but he also wanted to get into some of the other types of opera. So he finally, through the entree of a new girlfriend, um, uh, Maria Marcolini. Maria Marcolini had happened to have been the mistress of uh, Napoleon's brother. So not only did she get him entree into writing an opera for La Scala, but she also saved him from being conscripted into the army. She had a lot of influence. So he went to Milan, and when he was 20, this is 1812, he wrote his first opera seria, a full-length, serious opera, based on a play by Voltaire, Tancred, in Italian, Tancredi. Now, Tancredi was Rossini's first superstar hit. It was the piece that people sang and whistled in the streets. And if you think of um, Mozart, it was Non più andrai, and if it was Verdi, it was La Donna Mobile. Well, for, for Rossini, it was a tune from Tancredi called Di Tanti Palpiti. Di Tanti Palpiti uh, doesn't really leave the pattern of tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant, and that doesn't matter because Rossini could write this great tune over very simple chords, which meant everybody could sing it. You know, in 50 years, opera and, and really what we think of as classical music had gone from the province of the wealthy to something that was accessible to almost everyone. Uh, and that, of course, made savvy composers think, uh, we don't want to write the most complex, arcane, difficult music. We want to write music that uh, has units that are extremely memorable so that people go away remembering my music and not Signor X's music. So uh, Rossini, who was not just a musical genius but a very clever businessman and having grown up poor was not about to um, spend two years writing canons, <laughs> discovered that, that by writing these, these melodies that had little, little memorable units, uh, everybody knew them. So let me see if I can... Uh, they're real singers coming later, but I'm, I'm going to give you a kind of rendition of Di Tanti Palpiti. Di Tanti Palpiti, Di Tante Pene, Spero date mio bene, Spero merce. At me vedrai, ti rivedrò, mi rivedrai, ti rivedrò. Datemi palpiti, spero me. Just because that's the melody Rossini wrote, that doesn't mean that that's the melody that the singer can find themselves to. <laughs> because just the way in jazz today, the instrumentalists improvise over some kind of uh, structure, Rossini's singers and all the singers in this era 
did exactly the same thing with their opera tunes. So they might start out, uh, and every night they would do something different because they were truly improvising. Now, when Rossini wrote this, he had a specific soprano in mind, but uh, actually mezzo-soprano, but um, he would rewrite things given whoever was singing, even from night to night. If, if uh, singer Y is indisposed and singer Z is coming on stage and there's time to sit down for an hour and rewrite things, the composers of this day would do that. So it's very different from opera today when you go to sing La Boheme and uh, La Boheme in Argentina last year is pretty much going to be the same as Argentina in Moscow next year. It's, it's a set piece of music. Um, but in Rossini's time, the opera singers uh, were trained this way, so they were very comfortable uh, creating music as they went along. Uh, the public, of course, um, remembered the main tune, and uh, because this opera was such a hit. Pretty soon, Rossini was asked to um, compose what he wanted to do most of all, and that was an opera buffa. Uh, it was in his nature, which was a good nature, a good-humored nature, to write comedy. And Rossini decided that he would take this story of um, a young Italian woman who comes to um, see if she can get her beloved back from the clutches of uh, the Algerian uh, sultan. <laughs> okay, so she goes and um, remember that Rossini's dad spent much of his childhood in prison. The figure who did everything in his life and was certainly the smart one was his mom. And uh, Rossini, through all of his operas, creates these female characters who pull the strings and uh, really orchestrate everything. So they're not only uh, smart, but they're, they're conniving and they're crafty and they're lovable. And almost always, they're not the high-voiced singers, the sopranos who dominate most of the opera heroines, but they're mezzo-sopranos or contraltos even. They're women with lower voices. And uh, Rossini clearly preferred women, you know, who didn't go, oh, but went, oh, like that. <laughs> so so these, this whole repertoire exists. And, and uh, you know, since then, there have been generations of, of mezzo-sopranos who have loved having these parts because Rossini makes the star of the show so often a mezzo-soprano. So this opera, The Italian Girl in Algiers, L'Italiana in Algeri, which uh, Rossini wrote in 1813 when he was 21, <coughs> became the great hit of his life to this point. And um, I'm going to now introduce to you a wonderful singer who has come to perform an aria from L'Italiana in Algeri. This is the mezzo-soprano, Alyssa Anderson. We don't have programs with bios, so I'll just tell you quickly, Alyssa has sung all over from Albuquerque to <laughs> Santa Fe to <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between. <laughs> no, and lots of other states as well. But she does a lot of Rossini, but she does a lot of other things. And you may have seen that when the Santa Fe Opera was doing Albert Herring, um, that one night uh, Jill Grove was indisposed, and Alyssa, who was an apprentice covering the part, stepped on and did this major part in Albert Herring without batting an eyelash, and she was fabulous. So I'm thrilled that you're here with us. This piece, Cruda Sorte, Isabella, in typical Rossini heroine style, takes everything in hand and says, although fate is being unkind to me, I know how with just a look or a word to get everything I want from men, and I will have no problem at all. <laughs> Premio 
see her again. <laughs> Already, if you haven't heard a lot of Rossini in your life before now, you recognize many of the characteristics of his music. And the most obvious one is this wonderful, florid, athletic singing, which you call coloratura or fioratura or just fast notes or whatever you want. But <laughs> the Italians loved 
the use of the voice as an athletic instrument. And so we see that while in Germany, music was becoming more thoughtful and more complex harmonically, the Italians purposefully kept harmony simple so that the voice reigned supreme over everything. And this period later on was called the bel canto period. Bel canto is Italian for beautiful singing. But Rossini never heard this term applied to his own music. That came later, that, that looking backward, people called it that because the world had moved on to something else that wasn't so bel canto. So Rossini and two other well-known Italian composers are thought of as the school of bel canto. And the time period during which they flourished was really short. It was about 30 years. And we're talking about Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini. Okay, Rossini was born first of the three, but he outlived the other two. And uh, actually, Donizetti was born second and died second, and Bellini had a little short life in the middle. But <laughs> the three of them had distinct personalities. They wrote very differently. Uh, Rossini was the one who had the most fame and really eclipsed all other opera composers in Italy until in the year that... Um, L'Italiani Lageri was performed, Verdi was born, some couple hundred miles to the south, and uh, Verdi was really the first composer who, a, a, you know, s substituted for, for Rossini and, and the amount of popularity that Rossini had everywhere. Uh, when you went to one of the major Italian opera cities, which meant uh, Milan, Rome, Venice, Naples and Bologna, you would be hearing uh, several operas by other people and several operas by Rossini. So he was creating operas at a faster and faster rate. <coughs> Rossini could write an opera in about two or three weeks, uh, which is an amazing thing, right? <laughs> um, when, when, when he began, uh, his model was Mozart. He said later in life that Mozart was the inspiration of my youth and the, the desperation of all of my years as a professional composer because I could never equal Mozart, but the consolation of my old age because then I was just listening for pleasure. So uh, Rossini even earned the, the nickname the Little German because uh, everybody knew of his great love for Mozart. And he uh, tried to, to incorporate the beauty of melody, which was um, certainly a hallmark of Mozart in his own writing. We're going to do another aria from L'Italiana in Algeri, and in this, I think even um, a, a critical ear would say, yes, Rossini does, uh, at least in the orchestral interludes, which you won't be able to tell better for solo clarinet with the orchestra, um, are, uh, it, it's imita imitative of some aspects of Mozart. Um, you may know there's a big Mozart aria in the last Mozart opera, uh, La Clemenza di Tito, called Parto Parto, and it's a, a giant aria for clarinet obligato singer and orchestra. So I think that Rossini had that a little bit in mind when he wrote this aria in L'Italiani in Algeri. Now, while the mezzo-soprano is smart and all-knowing and figures out how to operate everything around. The tenors, whom the mezzo-sopranos always fall in love with, are merely expressing love. They are not trying to figure anything out. No one expects it. And uh, it's a perfect match because, you know, the tenor and the mezzo love to sing together, but, but it's clear who is going to uh, orchestrate um, all the events that occur in the opera. So um, the text of this aria you're about to hear is, love is wonderful, love is great. Wow, love is pretty terrific. You know, I think I'm in love, and did I mention it's a wonderful thing? So, <laughs> except in Italian, but you don't really need to know what the text means word for word. I would like to introduce you to our other fantastic singer who's with us here tonight, Javier Abreu.
Rossini didn't write the words to his own pieces. This was a libretto that was already in existence and in fact had been done five years before to someone else's music. This someone else is long since forgotten. And Rossini turned this opera into something amazing, a comic masterpiece. I think that uh, when, when he looked at a, a new project, which is an opera you've all heard of called The Barber of Seville, um, his success with L'Italiana in Algeri made him bold because the Barber of Seville uh, had been composed not just by some nobody, but by the great Giovanni Paisiello. And Rossini wanted to write an opera based on Beaumarchais's fantastic play because, of course, in an opera, the better the story is, uh, it helps, you know. Uh, no matter how terrific the music is, if the story is too silly, it doesn't, uh, well, sometimes it works. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> Rossini looked at Paisiello's opera and he thought, okay, I'll do this differently. Instead of calling it the Barber of Seville, I'll call it Almaviva, because the name of the count in Bar Beaumarchais's play is Count Almaviva. And he changed lots of details of the story. Well, guess what? Nobody was fooled at all by this. <laughs> and just the way the Café Florian and the Café Quadri were always fighting about who was playing the better farsa music, the uh, Paisiello supporters and the Rossini supporters were out in force. Uh, this was at the Teatro Argentina in Rome to have a huge brawl to determine whether Rossini was going to emerge triumphant over their dear Paisiello. Never mind what the operas were like, that wasn't even the issue. It was just a wonderful <laughs> excuse to have, to have a rivalry. So Rossini's opera was ultimately shouted down by the Paisiello supporters uh, the first night who not only uh, yelled so loudly that you couldn't hear the music but threw a cat on stage and all, <laughs> all kinds of things happened. So Rossini, who was of a sort of naturally phlegmatic temperament, um, just said, this is, this is fine, we'll, we'll live through this. And after a few nights, the Barber of Seville became, of course, a huge hit, and it is still a huge hit. Of all of Rossini's operas, of course, that's the one that's done the most. There are, in fact, 37 operas by Rossini, and uh, if you make a pilgrimage to Pesaro in the summer, uh, you can hear a lot of these operas, but this summer you don't have to go very far because Santa Fe Opera is performing the opera Maometto Seco. Now, you've seen Maometto in two lines, right? <laughs> but that is Maometto II, and if you want to sound really classy, you say, oh yes, we saw Maometto II. 
<laughs> and that is the opera. Okay, so uh, Maometto Secondo was one of those 37 operas, and it's one of the ones that didn't, uh, didn't last uh, the way, say, the Barber of Seville did. But Rossini, as I told you, was an enterprising businessman, so because it didn't survive as Maometto Secondo, took most of the same music and put it into another opera called The Siege of Corinth. So those two operas are very closely related by much of the music that's in them. And this is not the only time that Rossini did this. Uh, shortly after L'Italiana in Algeri, he wrote an opera called Aureliano in Palmira. You don't have to remember any of this stuff. But, but the overture went like this. Okay, I guess you know the rest of the story. You may not know that before the Barber of Seville there was another opera called Elisabetta, Regina d'Inghilterra, Elizabeth, Queen of England. And I'm sure that you'll notice how characteristically British the overture sounds. <laughs> So it took the third time <laughs> for this overture to be part of a hit. And thank God, you know, there are all these great overtures by Rossini. And uh, uh, some of them, <laughs> there are 37 operas, but there aren't 37 overtures, I can tell you that. <laughs> so there was a lot of recycling, but he was borrowing from himself and there was no intellectual property law at the time anyway. <laughs> so there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, recycled Rossini, I guess you used to say. Uh, the overture, by the way, to the uh, Italian girl in Algiers was as much of a hit as anything else in the opera because uh, Rossini, again, found a formula that was so successful of taking the tiniest germ um, and he always has uh, rhythms that contrast each other so that one uh, statement, very simple, seems lyric and the other is bouncy. Um, in music, when you say a rhythm is dotted, you mean instead of going, it goes, that one note is longer, and then a short one, and then a long one, and then a short one. Rossini loves the dotted rhythm. If you listen to his operas, whether the overtures or the sung part, you'll hear thousands and thousands of these dotted rhythms. So here's the 10-second uh, version of the overture to Italian Girl in Algiers. Um, So you already get the idea, right? <laughs> so uh, there, then there's a second subject that's something happens which becomes Rossini's trademark for the rest of his life. He writes something very short, something like that, and starts with the orchestra playing as softly as it's possible for an orchestra to humanly play. And it's repeated and repeated and repeated and it gets the, the loudest fortissimo so that the rafters are shaking. And this became known as the Rossini Crescendo. He was even called Signor Crescendo. And, <laughs> Every Rossini overture employs this. Some of the arias do too, but most particularly in the overtures. Uh, well, we talked about the Barber of Seville. Uh, in the Barber of Seville, uh, first there's a, <laughs> you, you've heard this in Aureliano and in Queen Elizabeth, right? But uh, before that. So within, 10 seconds, there are three very distinct musical gestures. This heroic announcement, open the curtain, and then once we have your attention, right, sort of sneaking around, because this overture fits the Barber of Seville's plot exactly, remember that, right? <laughs> Sounds like love and longing. Well, fortunately, all operas are about the same things, so. <laughs> overtures can be used in that way. And Rossini actually said it does not matter what the um, music is, that music by itself and his operas had no content. Of course he was speaking tongue in cheek to a certain extent, but music itself had no content until it was given text and situation on stage. The, the first Rossini opera I ever conducted was The Thieving Magpie. Uh, the Thieving Magpie 
as we did it in a German opera house, was Die Diebische Elster, because <laughs> we didn't do anything except in German. So uh, I learned a couple things about Rossini right away because I didn't know the thieving magpie. But there's a famous aria in the Barber of Seville that goes, Una voce poco fa. Well, the soprano comes out in the thieving magpie and she sings, Di piacer mi balza il cor, which is pretty much the same thing, except just with a few different notes. The two could be sung at the same time and sound very nice together. So the other thing I learned was that in the courtroom scene, a woman is about to be tried and condemned to death. And the music, which is very serious, obviously, in this situation, goes. OK? Now, you probably know that the overture to The Thieving Magpie has something rather similar. So Rossini takes a theme which clearly in the overture sounds like it's very good natured and jolly and turns it into something deathly serious. And of course the opera has a happy ending, just to let you know. <laughs> but amazing how he could use the same material and, and make it have different characteristics. I would like you to hear something not sung by me from the Barber of Seville because it is, after all, the most famous of all Rossini operas. So Javier, if you would oblige us, we're going to um, give you what the Count Almaviva sings at the beginning of the opera. Now, Beaumarchais' play was the first play of the French Revolution. It showed that the aristocracy did not have any brains at all compared to the working classes. And, sorry, he's the aristocracy. <laughs> but he has a lot of money, and he hires a very clever man from the working classes Figaro, the barber, right? This is the opera that has Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. The Count has fallen in love with a beautiful young girl. He cannot seem to gain access to her house because she is being held virtually prisoner by her tutor, Dr. Bartolo. But Figaro, uh, who hasn't come on the scene yet, figures out eventually how to get them together. But at this point, the hapless Count is just singing a serenade under her window. And as you'll remember, the texts of all Rossini love arias go, love is wonderful, the great moment of love is about here. So that is more or less what he's going to say. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
ecco quel caro sembiante. Oh, dolce amante, oh, te. When Rossini came on the scene, as I said, he eclipsed other opera composers, and so he was the leading influential figure in the opera world. But the music world was moving toward a more and more romantic, romantic with a capital R, kind of expression, and uh, nobody could avoid being swept along with that tide. So while Rossini continued to write his opera buffa, the funny operas like the Barber of Seville and the opera he wrote a year after that, La Cenerentola, which is Cinderella. You've probably heard Cinderella at the Santa Fe Opera, if not somewhere else. That's the one. Uh and then. Uh also wanted to write <laughs> opera seria. Opera seria, the serious operas, were the romantic ones in which the heroines went crazy and the tenors died and, you know, <laughs> it was a lot of fun for everybody. So opera seria meant taking romantic stories like um, Shakespeare's Othello. Now Shakespeare's Othello had one problem in that the classic opera seria on the continent had tragic situations, but ultimately virtue triumphed and the story ended happily. You know oh. Othello doesn't end very happily. <laughs> so Rossini changed the ending and made it a happy ending in which Desdemona at the last moment, I'm not making this up, this is how much fashion had changed. The original Tancredi shocked people because it had a tragic ending and Rossini had to turn it into a happy ending in a later version. The original Otello had a happy ending because Rossini thought that's what the public wanted and lo and behold in those 10 years taste had changed completely, less than 10 years, and, and suddenly he had to change the ending to a tragic ending. Now, I would just like to tell you that Opera Southwest down in Albuquerque is presenting Otello in the fall with voting boxes so that <laughs> when the audience comes in, they can put in a card that says she dies or she lives. These are counted during the intermission. The conductor and the cast are informed, but no one in the audience knows. I guess the super title person must be informed. And it's the French Lieutenant's Woman as Rossini Opera. Okay, so I think this is fabulous. Um, Rossini also chose a work by Walter Scott. Walter Scott, the quintessential romantic writer. You know, the stag at Eve has drunk his fill. When I became the um, music director of Lake George Opera, I thought, you know, they've done a lot of musicals, but they really haven't done a lot of um, heavy duty opera. And I thought, let's do Rossini's The Lady of the Lake. And I went into a bookstore downtown. I don't know what 
possessed me to do this, but there were like two copies of Reader's Digest and an old copy of The Joy of Cooking. And then this little, <laughs> little book, which was an edition from 1912 of The Lady of the Lake. And I thought, it's a sign, we're gonna do it. So, so we did The Lady of the Lake, and, and this was one of Rossini's opera serias, romantic, it ends happily, but in the meantime, there's blood and guts and war and jealousy and betrayal, and it's wonderful. Now, I said that Rossini loved the mezzo-soprano, but he also loved the castrato. He actually narrowly avoided becoming one because <laughs> his family was very poor, and you know that the reason the castrati flourished in Italy is because families couldn't feed their kids, and um, you know, it, was, it was a poverty of a kind that we can't even imagine. So getting a few scudi for having your, your son castrated before they went through uh, puberty because the church didn't, you know, they wanted high voices, but they didn't want women. So they, uh, they had lots of castrati singing in the choruses. And Rossini said, this is the most beautiful voice. So he wrote some of these parts that are now done by mezzos for castrati. And uh, uh, that's what in opera they mean when they say pants rolls, that um, these, these guys um, now, of course, we don't have castrati, thankfully. So um, either you have a, uh, a mezzo-soprano or a countertenor, but a countertenor, you know, sings high because he wants to, not because he has to. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so there are no more castrati. There are recordings of castrati which sound god-awful, but everybody, you know, of course, it's a hundred-year-old recording. Everybody says that the sound of the castrato voice was truly extraordinary. So the male castrato part in um, La Donna del Lago, in The Lady of the Lake, is Malcolm. Malcolm falls in love with the heroine, who is the Lady of the Lake, and uh, the other man in the story who loves the heroine happens to be the king in disguise, because it's opera, so he's in disguise, but <laughs> the king at the end is magnanimous and gives the girl to the young man that she loves even though he could have forced it to come out otherwise. So uh, Alyssa is going to sing us this fantastic aria from The Lady of the Lake. <laughs> you have to suspend your disbelief that Alyssa is a boy. <laughs> you want to wear my tie? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Rossini is captivating audiences just like you 200 years later, there's a whole other movement going on in the opera world. Opera houses are getting larger, opera orchestras are getting larger, and the singers whose voices are larger are required to sing these more muscular operas, in which being able to sing with incredible flexibility, like what you've heard from these two great singers, 
is not so important as just being able to plant yourself and make the maximum amount of sound. <laughs> this is not to say this isn't also great opera, but you can see that the bel canto aesthetic is being threatened as operas by Meyerbeer and uh, other composers who are scoring for giant opera houses uh, in Paris, for example, where there's always got to be a huge chorus. So Rossini begins to sense he needs to um, branch out. And he, he gets invited to England, and he has a huge success, and he gets 7,000 pounds. That's an 1823 pounds, you know, there's millions of dollars. And, and he's, he's just the richest opera composer around, and, and he's coming back through Paris, and he redecides Paris is really the place, because that's where opera is moving forward. He decides that he will negotiate with the Paris Opera House, and they at first suggest he write five operas a year. And he says, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then they offer him more money and say, how about two operas a year? And he says, this is getting close, you know? So finally they agree that for uh, uh, something astronomical, he'll write one opera a year. So Rossini settles into Paris, and he's living next door to Baron Rothschild, you know, in a fantastic house. And the first day, Rothschild sends a servant over with a most beautiful bunch of grapes as a, a welcome present for Rossini. And Rossini says, send these back and tell him I don't take my wine in pills. So <laughs> Rossini loves wine. He loves wine, and he loves port and he loves Stilton cheese and he's, he's uh, acquired tastes for all the best, richest foods that are, that are available anywhere. But his favorite, you're going to love this, his favorite is truffles. <laughs> so Rossini once said he only cried twice in his life, once when he heard Caffarello, the most beautiful singer, and once when he dropped a piece of turkey that he had stuffed with truck, truffles into Lake Como. <laughs> <And> <laughs> He, he was truly a truffle lover, and he said, truffles are the Mozart of mushrooms. The <laughs> <laughs> so he was in the right city, because Paris, of course, had great opera and great food. Uh, and uh, Rossini proceeded to write one opera a year for the Paris Opera. Now, some of these operas, of course, were recycled versions of operas he'd written in Italy, but the French hadn't heard them, so it was perfect. <laughs> So as I said, Maometto II became the Siege of Corinth, and he also wrote the uh, Moses in Egypt while he was there, and the wonderful comedy Conte Ori. Uh, actually, the music from Conte Ori came from an earlier opera <coughs> called The Voyage to Reims. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about The Voyage to Reims in a second. But Rossini was a, a very happy man in Paris. Um, he married, of course, a world-famous mezzo-soprano, uh, Isabella Colbran, Spanish. She was a big star. She was seven years older than he, and uh, the two of them, of course, created many of these operas together. He um, was still, though, irked by the fact that Meyerbeer's operas kept getting larger and louder, and he didn't really want to move in that direction. So his final opera, William Tell, you all know the overture, <laughs> nothing else, right? Uh, the, the opera William Tell was written in 1829 when Rossini was only 37, and he said, that's it. He'd written seven of these operas for the French, and he said to the French government, I have a really good proposal. Now I'll write zero operas, and you can double my salary so that I'll remain in Paris. And guess what? They agreed. They did it. <laughs> they did it. So Rossini stayed, and um, actually... He didn't stay for too long, but uh, his health began to deteriorate. And at a certain point, um, Rossini had to leave Paris, return to Italy. But then, um, uh, miraculously, a doctor cured him completely, and he went back to Paris, spent the last 15 years of his life living in Paris, and uh, wrote a little bit, but never an opera again. Now, you could say that some of the things he wrote, like the Stabat Mater and the Little Solemn Mass, which is neither little nor solemn, um, are kind of like operas. And he wrote lots of small pieces, which he called Sins of My Old Age. But uh, the, the uh, opera period was over. And Meyerbeer, of course, kept going on writing these gigantic things. And then, then there was Wagner and there was Verdi. Now, Wagner and uh, Rossini actually met and uh, they discussed their, their very different uh, philosophies. 
Um, Rossini said, I did see Tannhäuser, and it's a very significant work that deserves a second hearing, but of course I wouldn't go to see it a second time. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently Wagner was not bothered by this. But uh, Verdi and Rossini also had a, a friendly relationship. Verdi was 21 years younger, but to his dying day, he had framed on his wall something that Rossini had written to him that said, from your friend, the fourth-rate composer, Rossini, uh, to, to the illustrious composer, Giuseppe Verdi, who is a fifth-rate pianist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which apparently was true. <laughs> so so uh, Rossini did have relationships with all these people, including his arch enemy, Meyerbeer. But Meyerbeer died first. And uh, Meyerbeer's nephew came to Rossini and said, Maestro, I would like you to look at this. I have written, and Rossini's already thinking, oh God, save me. Uh, I have written a funeral march for my uncle. Because Rossini was always being approached by amateur composers who wanted him to assess their works. So Rossini looked at this funeral march for Meyerbeer and he said, you want to know what I really think? Oh yes, Maestro. It would have been so much better if you had died and he had survived to write something <laughs> for you. <laughs> so, anyway, Rossini left opera and, and uh, left us all this great opera. I was telling you about the voyage, voyage to Reims, Viaggio a Reims. Um, Rossini depended upon the patronage, of course, of uh, Louis XVIII, who had made this great deal with him. And when Louis XVIII died in 1825, um, it was time for a new king, and that meant it was time for some kind of diplomatic maneuver that would ensure uh, Rossini's continued financial subsidy from the French government. So Rossini said, I'm going to write an opera that's not part of my contract, and I'm not going to charge you anything, uh, but it's just an opera to honor the new king, Charles X. <coughs> So the plot of the opera is that 14 um, Europeans are on the way to Reims to see the coronation of Charles X, and they never make it there. They all get into a hotel uh, on the way, an albergo, and, and they can't, um, the coaches are all down, and so instead of going to the coronation, um, they just sing a lot of fantastic music for, <laughs> for no apparent reason other than that they're all stuck in the same hotel. So uh, this, very, um, sh this, this very superficial plot uh, is a vehicle for some of Rossini's most fantastic music. And uh, as, as I might have mentioned, uh, the music um, all makes its way into Count Ori. So although Rossini said, you don't have to pay me for this and it's not part of my contract, he also reused all the music <laughs> and did get paid the second time around. So we're going to finish our program with a duet from the, yes, finally, too, uh, <laughs> with a duet from, from the Viaggio a Reims. Um, the, the plot, is, such as it is, is that the um, Count has... Um, fallen in love with one of the other people who's come to the hotel, the Marchese Melibea, the Marquis, and um, he has seen her talking to one of the other guests and naturally assumed that um, she, is, she is involved with him. So at first uh, they settle this jealous dispute and she assures him that no, that's not the case and that indeed it's time to sing a rapturous and fantastic Rossini duet. Um, and, and once again, the plot is, is fairly irrelevant and self-explanatory. So, uh, Alyssa and Javier, please. <laughs> Dio, 
calde di pura, di pura face, di pura pura face. Osai la pace con i senza tuardo, con i senza tuardo, i senza tuardo, osai la pace con i senza tuardo, con i senza Oh, 
si mi vita del il cor, il cor mi va, il seno si mi vita del il cor, il seno il cor, il seno il cor, se Nothing better than live opera, right? <laughs> Are the cookies still out there? <laughs> no more. Thank you all. Thank you all so much.